Yo en realidad nunca he pensado en irme de, de Cuba. For decades, it was very, very, very hard to travel to Cuba. The letters that came from my cousins were beautiful. The American government was restricting where we could go. Once the travel ban was lifted, my dad, my uncle, my sisters, we kind of just got there as soon as we can. My last trip, I got to meet my grandmother's family. It's really cool meeting, you know, that side of the family. They're all farmers. Being in Cuba felt to me like most people there have what I would consider to be a very Christ-like way of living. It was the most racially integrated culture I've ever experienced. I didn't get the feeling of being treated less than by anybody. I visited several times to see could I live here. It's not an easy place to live. It's under a blockade. Less than two years after the revolution, the U.S. imposed the embargo against Cuba. The idea behind the embargo was always to starve the Cuban people. So what are we stopping? Food, medicine, construction materials, automobiles, electronics, appliances, clothes washers. So the United States has influence to basically shut down any other country or they want to or, or severely restrict the resources they have coming in and going out. European banks get $100 million fines for doing business with Cuba. Lifting the embargo will be the best thing, uh, regardless of the problems that we have here. I think those problems is something that we have to solve ourselves. Si tú realmente quieres un cambio para Cuba, genuino, y quieres ayudar al pueblo de Cuba, Entonces, tú no estarías a favor del embargo. Welcome. Welcome. I'm glad you can be with us. Uh, this is John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. And we have a rare treat today. I hope you've all had a chance to, to watch the program to watch the film uh, and so that what you'll hear is from first from the filmmaker and then from several friends who have themselves watched it and will have some reaction to the film but also will be adding to what the film itself presented. Um, we're as everybody probably knows this is the 60th anniversary of the embargo um, it, which is it's younger than me um, but probably older than a number of people watching this. Uh, it was not forever and it doesn't have to be forever. Uh, and we'll hope in the course of, of this program that you will, will see uh, how it can be ended. So we'll first start out with the filmmaker, uh, Mirella Martinelli. You've probably read her bio. Uh, it's been on the blog page. Um, we'll have the link on the chat. Um, so you'll be able to, to find out more about her history. Um, let me just say in terms of the way this functions that the chat will be closed up until the discussion time. Um, and at once the discussion is open, then, then we'll open the chat. Uh, but while people are making the presentations, the chat itself will be closed. Uh, if you have questions, use the Q&A function, not the chat function. You can put questions in the Q&A and, and then we'll come back to it. So I interrupted myself and interrupted my introduction. Uh, Mirella Martinelli, unmute yourself first. Hi. Hello, everyone. And thank you all for being here for your interest in this subject. Um, today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about frenemies in terms of what was the purpose of me making this film and how was the making of the film? Because Frenemies is structured to reveal several angles of my experience with Cuba. I was born in Brazil, 
And when I was three years old, there was a military coup backed by the CIA that brought about a 20 year military dictatorship in Brazil with all the horrors that a dictatorship can bring, like people disappearing, torture, no freedom of press, no freedom to form political parties. And uh, it was no communist dictatorship. This was a very capitalist dictatorship and very violent. And Brazilians who were suffering a lot during that period held Cuba in a very dear place in their hearts, the place of hope because Cuba had stood up to the United States. Many years later, living in Florida, uh, Obama was uh, warming relations with Cuba and losing the travel ban. And so my US born husband could go to Cuba. And I had been uh, astonished ever since I started living in the United States on how much the red scare was so ingrained in the minds of US people. So I became interested in making a film about uh, perceptions of Cuba, how these people that have been born and raised here uh, and had received all this red scare propaganda, how do they feel about Cuba once they saw it firsthand? So I went to Cuba in 2017 and I felt the weight of the embargo. A lot of people, first thing they see when they get to Havana, they say, wow, the buildings are you know, falling apart. And guess what? They can't buy construction materials to fix their homes. And all these cars, old cars riding in the streets, well, they can't buy cars. So they have to keep fixing the old 1950s US gas guzzlers to survive or some Soviet old car. And then there's difficulty in getting gas. So there are just too many aspects that um, the embargo seeps into the lives of everyday Cubans. So the embargo just became the focus of the film. Back in Florida, I went into researching more about this embargo because there are a lot of things that are not quite visible, right? Like international banking, international markets. And I started uh, filming interviews with people in the United States from different parts of the country, diverse ethnicity and age. And I was interested in hearing from US born people and also Cuban Americans, first and second generation. And I went back to Cuba in 2019 with the intention of uh, getting some candid interviews from uh, Cubans just on the streets, but I also had scheduled interviews with people from different backgrounds, doctors, attorneys, architects, farmers, and I started getting people cancel on us. And in some instances, even like the previous night, they had confirmed, yes, we're giving you the interview. The next day we'd get there with the equipment and everything. And they had decided not to give us interviews. So um, some people that didn't restrict what they were going to say, and were willing to be on camera were artists. And that's how Miguel Coyula and Lynn Cruz ended up being interviewed for the film. And that's how the authoritarian aspect of the Cuban government ended up in the film too. Because as a documentary filmmaker, I am committed to express the truth as I have researched and witnessed as best as I can. So that aspect is there because it's part of the reality. But that also brought to me the obligation of examining Florida politics because there are, there's a, an elite of Cuban Americans here that give money to both major parties. And this group includes people like sugar barons that have you know, contaminated Lake Okeechobee and damaged the Everglades. And they're not doing any good to Florida either. And their match with these greedy, selfish politicians um, just keep alive the Red Scare, um, which you know just blurs uh, all the intricacies of this relationship and makes it like a childish cowboy and Indian imperialist kind of view if you buy into that discourse. But we as voters, we have power. So for example, now in 2022, 
we have elections for uh, US Senate and we have elections in Florida. We have the opportunity to vote Marco Rubio out. <laughs> so at the end of the film, My Film Frenemies, the film turns itself back to the embargo uh, and examines it more closely because I am a US citizen. And I bet most of you who are watching and who are participating here are too. So I feel that we have the responsibility to end this cruel policy. And it's not our responsibility neither. It is our right to try to topple the Cuban government. It is up to the Cuban people who live in the island to deal with their government, with the changes they want. US people need to learn to respect the sovereignty of other countries. The United States is totally on the wrong side of this uh, the, because Cuba never attacked the United States ever. Um, and so you, you can see the impact of this six decade long embargo in the island and it's small island. Cuba is an island nation that is smaller than Florida. And so, <laughs> The embargo has gigantic effects. And think about the authoritarian side of it too. You know, we just say, oh, the authoritarian side of the Cuban government, how authoritarian is this embargo? You know, people in the United States can't visit as tourists. They have to be explaining, jumping through hoops and da 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 da, da. Cuban Americans who live in this country, work, pay taxes here, can't send remittances to their family. How authoritarian is that? So there are several, several aspects of this embargo that violates international law that are just awful. And now, for example, with COVID, they didn't have syringes to do their COVID vaccine rollout. And a lot of other medical supplies are stopped by the embargo and medical um, technology, clean energy technology, internet software, you know, international financing, you know, there's just so many aspects. So don't allow yourself to be fooled by fake news of uh, right wingers saying that the embargo doesn't exist. You know, this is just complete craziness. And for people who are watching this, and if you live in Florida, check out, there are some people running for US Senate that have in their platform and have pledged to fight to end the embargo. For example, Albert Fox, Will Sanchez, Josh Wheel, for example, are three of these candidates. So if you live in Florida, please have, you, have your, that in mind when you vote. And if you don't live in Florida, I, you know, keep engaged and keep people uh, educated because people who have a sense of justice really need to understand how important it is to, to end the embargo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mika. Um, we're, the way this will happen is we'll have several other speakers and then there'll be a discussion among all of the speakers and then there'll be an opportunity to answer your questions. Um, so the, the next speaker is Phil Brenner. If you've looked at his bio, you'll see that he's a professor emeritus of international relations and history at American University. Um, if you look in the chat, I think you'll see the speakers list, uh, but uh, if not, we'll put it up later. Um, but Phil Brenner. Thank you, John. Thank you for organizing uh, this webinar. I'd like to provide uh, our audience with just some factual basis on the history of the embargo. Many people uh, date the embargo from June 1960, when President Eisenhower reduced the Cuban sugar quota to zero in retaliation for the Cuban nationalization of Esso and Texaco refineries. But authorization for a formal embargo did not come until September 1961, when Congress passed the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act. It included the following. No assistance shall be furnished under this act to the present government of Cuba as an additional means of implementing and carrying out in, and carrying into effect the policy of the preceding sentence. The president is authorized to establish and maintain a total embargo upon all trade between the United States and Cuba. Two and a half months later, on November 30th, 1961, President Kennedy authorized the largest covert operation undertaken until that time, 
known as Operation Mongoose. It was a four-part program intended to overthrow the Cuban government. One aspect of the project was political isolation. And in January 1962, the United States convinced a two-thirds majority of the OAS to suspend Cuba's membership. A second aspect was economic warfare. On February 3rd, 1962, 60 years ago, as John mentioned, the president used the authority granted to him by Congress to impose an embargo on Cuba, including on food and medicine. Two elements of this stand out. First, the, the embargo was created as a distinct component of a plan to overthrow the Cuban government. It wasn't simply about denying assistance to Cuba as Congress had authorized. It was created to overthrow the Cuban government. Second, in invoking the 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act, the president made clear that this was an act of warfare. So both elements provide Cuba with good reason to view the, the embargo as an act of war and as a means of supporting the Cuban government. Today, several statutes add elements to the embargo. So 1988, the Berman Amendment to the International Emergency Economic Powers Act exempts artistic works and informational materials from the embargo. The 1992 Cuban Democracy Act, sometimes known as the Torricelli Bill, prohibits by law as distinct from a presidential discretion, trade between the subsidiaries of US companies abroad in Cuba. It also authorizes humanitarian donations of food and medicine. The 1966 Cuban Liberty and the Democratic Solidarity Act, which people know as the Helms-Burton Act, codified prior executive orders. That's to say all of the embargo until that point well, except for the 1992 Torricelli bill, all of the embargo was uh, under executive orders under the authority granted to Cong granted the president under in Cong by Congress in 1961. Now the embargo was law, but codifying all the prior executive orders, uh, thus reducing a president's re uh, discretion to lift the embargo. It also gives U.S. citizens and corporations the right to sue in federal court anyone in the United States or abroad who is trafficking, that is benefiting from nationalized property. Now, this provision was waived by Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama because of its extraterritorial impact on, uh, on our allies. But President Trump did not waive the provision and neither is President Biden. In 2000, the trade sanctions and reform Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act legalized the sale of agricultural commodities to Cuba, but only for cash advance, making it difficult. It also permits Cuba travel to Cuba by U.S. citizens under 12 categories, such as support for the Cuban people. The Trump administration designation in 2020 of Cuba as a state sponsor international terrorism triggered a variety of sanctions, although most of those are already in place under the broader embargo. Finally, both the Trump and Biden administrations have imposed sanctions on Cuban individuals under the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act of 2012. It freezes the US assets and denies entry to the United States of persons guilty of human rights abuses. So the takeaway from this history is the following. The embargo is made up of several components and it's not easily dismantled by a simple act. And two, the embargo was created as an act of war and remains so today. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, that is a really good summary uh, the film itself does it and that adds to it. And if you go back to the blog page where the bios are, there are a number of other resources listed, including uh, an excellent, uh, several good articles um, 
including uh, one from Cuba that that uh, Ed Augustin wrote and a good article from Bill Leo Grande. Uh, but there's also a compilation that was done by the National Security Archive of all of the documents, uh, including the, the most famous one, which makes clear the original goal was to create suffering to overturn the government. So our, our next speaker, um, Jorge Quintana. Uh, um, did you want me to show the... Uh, I'm sorry, yes, thank you, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, we had we wanted to break up the talking heads for a bit. Thank you for reminding me. Go ahead. La mujer cubana ha sido una mujer muy luchadora. Va a la calle y va pensando que lleva para la casa. Junto a mi hermana y mi mamá, llevamos este negocio familiar, Sur. Sur fue creado alrededor del año 1992. Nosotros decidimos que nos hacía falta incorporar otras actividades para ayudar a nuestra economía. Todo surgió a partir de los materiales que teníamos y las ganas de crear. Un bolso que, por supuesto, a la mujer cubana de los 90 y de hoy le sigue funcionando muchísimo. El bolso Zulu representa precisamente lo cubano por la durabilidad y la resistencia con que realmente tratamos de, de hacer y crear. las afectaciones de las medidas de Trump al negocio ha incidido de forma directa porque han afectado la entrada al país de materia prima. Nos afectan tanto la entrada de turismo, que son nuestros clientes potenciales, como la adquisición de materiales como la piel, los hilos, los herrajes, en fin, todos los materiales con que regularmente trabajamos. Eso que los políticos dicen que nada más que se afecta al gobierno de Cuba es falso. Realmente nos afecta a todos. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, slight miscue on my part that we had uh, have included two short clips that Oxfam created and Stephanie will explain a little about them later, but uh, that will give you an additional flavor of the impact of the embargo on, on Cubans. So as I started to say, our next speaker is Jorge Quintana, whose organization, the Center for Democracy in the Americas is one of the, the big three of Washington uh, organizations along with the Washington Office on Latin America and the Latin America Working Group that are our eyes and ears and hands in the uh, world of Congress and the administration. Uh, Jorge. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you for the um, five minutes to cover uh, the state of play in the executive branch, as well as the halls of Congress. Uh, before I jump into that, I, I, I want to just comment on the film. Something I appreciated about it was it introduces a diverse array of characters, all with, you know, different viewpoints. Uh, in the policy debate discussion that goes on here in D.C., nuance is rarely found. And I think anything we can do to introduce those diverse voices uh, help bring that necessary nuance to the discussion. Anyway, on to the state of play uh, with the president and, and Congress. Uh, for those who had hoped that President Joe Biden would, in the words of candidate Joe Biden, promptly, <clears throat> promptly reverse the failed Trump policies that have inflicted harm on the Cuban people and done nothing to advance democracy and human rights, it has been a long year of inaction and frustration. Since taking office, the administration has failed to act upon campaign promises, promises on travel, 
promises on remittances, to reinstate the Cuban Family Reunification Parole Program, and to generally re-engage with Cuba. The administration initially maintained back in January of 2021 that Cuba policy was simply not a priority. From the beginning, they have articulated that the administration's policy would be governed by two principles, support for democracy and human rights, and that Americans, especially Cuban Americans, are the best ambassadors to Cuba. The administration also expressed that it would take its own path following a policy review. Months went by. Following the protests in Cuba in July, July 11th, it appeared there was a new sense of urgency in the administration's Cuba policy review. Cuba was now a top priority for the administration. And the administration ordered the State Department to review restaffing of the U.S. Embassy in Havana and announced the creation of a remittance working group. Along the way, the administration has also increased the number of sanctions on specific persons in Cuba's government who the administration has identified as being responsible for the violation of the human rights. This is the administration's way of standing with the Cuban people. Of course, those very same Cuban people are now facing the 60th year of a comprehensive embargo without any relief, even during a pandemic. While restaffing of the embassy in Havana seems to be slowly on its way, there is still no way for me to send a few dollars to my cousins in Santiago de Cuba to help out while they live through a genuine public health and economic crisis. It's quite the day when I could theoretically send remittances to Afghanistan, but not to Cuba. So on the part of the administration, inaction has turned into action an action that harms ordinary Cubans and runs counter to our very own policy goals. As a simple example, the line about Americans, especially Cuban Americans being our best ambassadors, yet the restrictions on travel, the need for specific licenses on those very ambassadors makes it nearly impossible to actually visit Cuba. Um, I couldn't help but notice in the Oxfam kit, uh, Mandy from Zulu Bags, all those businesses and the United States believes that encouraging independent business in Cuba is a policy goal. Yet those very businesses are hurt by the lack of Americans being able to travel to Cuba. Some have stated that this is a political decision by the administration to, to help in Florida. And if it is, all I can say it's bad policy based on bad politics. So what should the administration be doing? Well, this past December, 114 representatives in Congress signed down to a letter uh, full of sound policy steps that the president could take from remo removing the specific licenses required to send medical supplies such as testing kits and respiratory devices to Cuba to lift in, lifting all restrictions on banking and financial transactions. <clears throat> Rolling back the Trump administration's restrictions on travel to Cuba and removing Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Th that letter is just full of solid, practical advice the administration could take today, powers well within its reach, that would truly enable the administration to further its policy goals and truly stand with the Cuban people. Uh, in the Senate, of course, we've got a 50-50 split and many political commentators uh, discuss the, the power that Senator Menendez, a staunch anti-engagement voice uh, to the president, uh, has to play in a 50-50 Senate and is critical uh, for the president's agenda. That being said, the United States Cuba Trade Act has been introduced uh, and that would fully lift the trade embargo on Cuba, repealing all of it, the Helms-Burton Act, the Cuban Democracy Act, the Trading with the Enemy Act, et cetera. Uh, and that act would finally allow U.S. citizens to travel freely to and from Cuba and would also get rid of the uh, limits on remittances. Now, it, it is a dire situation in D.C. There seems to be nothing but inaction. Uh, but I, I want to leave everyone with some language from the letter uh, signed on by the 114 members of Congress, uh, where it states, Finally, protecting human rights in Cuba, including the right to protest, is better served by principal engagement rather than unilateral isolation, which has proven to be a failed policy. In fact, today, 
Following almost five years of tightened U.S. sanctions, Cuba's social movements that emerged during the reproachment years find their space for public debate and free expression more constrained than in 2016. Engagement is more likely to enable the political, economic, and social openings that the Cubans may desire and to ease the hardships that Cubans face today. So yes, we should stand with the Cuban people, but unfortunately, many of our policy decisions get in the way of our policy goals. Uh, I wish I had a rosier picture of DC to paint, but uh, it, it is what it is, as we say. And I think right now the important thing is uh, reach out to your members of Congress, to your communities, and uh, thank them for the letter, but also encourage them to keep the heat on President Joe Biden, because there's a lot of tools available to this administration that they are not taking advantage of. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, if you want to know what's going on on a weekly basis in Cuba, and in the US government. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to the free newsletter that CDA produces, if you go to their website, uh, Center for Democracy in the Americas, you will be able to do that. And uh, all of us depend on the hard work that they do to, to make it visible, to make go through the amount of news that comes out and give us the most useful things. Um, I think I have I'll now put that put, in the chat, John. It is all right to put it in the chat, the subscription. Um, I also think I've put in the chat now the speakers list uh, that everybody should be able to see. Um, so our next speaker is Stephanie Burgos, is uh, with Oxfam America, um, part of the uh, American firmament that has been able to be involved with Cuba uh, through thick and thin with problems on both sides of the straits, both from the Cuban government and the American government, but uh, the NGOs have played an important role and Oxfam has been certainly one of the longest standing. Stephanie. Thank you, John, for convening this uh, event, and, and thanks to Marella for the, for the film. I want to add two essential points. I, I think somebody has background noise. Somebody has their... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I want to add two essential points. First, I'll highlight the humanitarian consequences of the embargo, and second, the human face of those impacts, particularly on women in Cuba as you saw in, in the little short. There's a worsening humanitarian situation in Cuba due largely to US sanctions that exacerbate the COVID pandemic and related economic crisis. The US embargo obstructs humanitarian assistance to the population in Cuba and the US is failing to comply with four internationally recognized principles that are core to humanitarian action. Humanity, impartiality, independence, and neutrality. The U.S. has humanitarian waivers that in theory allow for the shipment of humanitarian aid, but in practice, licensing requirements, end use verification, banking sector restrictions, and fear of reprisal for somehow running afoul of U.S. law severely complicate sending humanitarian aid to Cuba from the U.S. and other countries. Oxfam America does not send humanitarian aid to Cuba and few US-based nonprofits do so because of all the restrictions and myriad requirements under the embargo that generate high transaction costs to deal with logistical challenges and liability concerns. Some US vendors are resistant or unwilling to provide goods and services destined for Cuba like medicines or medical supplies. And some products are difficult to license such as medical instruments and diagnostic equipment. Nonprofits based in Europe and elsewhere face similar obstacles. There's a limited market when seeking suppliers for goods and services to Cuba, since only a few non-US based companies are willing to take the risk of running into problems with the US Treasury. As a result, goods and services often cost more to procure and may be of poor quality or less effective than could otherwise be obtained if it weren't for US sanctions and they require longer travel and take more time to deliver, resulting in delays and otherwise unnecessary carbon emissions. 
The Oxfam International Confederation, which is financially independent from Oxfam America, has been working on the ground in Cuba for nearly three decades, supporting local actors to build a more just, inclusive, and sustainable society. In addition to confronting obstacles itself due to the US embargo, Oxfam's experience on the ground has provided insights into the human impact of US sanctions. We've seen and documented how the embargo directly harms people in Cuba in their everyday lives. And I'm putting in the, the chat a link to uh, Oxfam's document from, uh, that was published last year. Um, women suffer the worst impacts of the embargo, which accentuates and deepens gender inequality, as you saw a little bit in, in the short that we showed too. Women in Cuba dedicate an average of over 35 hours per week for family care work, and 46% of households on the island are headed by women. They're the center of families as providers and caregivers. The embargo creates shortages that are a big added stress for people in their daily lives, and women bear the brunt of this in their efforts to feed and care for their families, such as limits and options for daily transportation or for access to certain goods and services, dealing with obsolete technology and so forth. Women also bear a greater burden from impacts of the embargo in their professional lives. Women account for 71% of healthcare workers and are on the front lines of pandemic response. They comprise 84% of workers in clinical and biotechnology labs and are leaders and active participants in strategic fields like biotech that are affected by loss of scientific collaborations and exchanges across borders. And at the same time, they're mothers and family caregivers. There are also a growing number of women entrepreneurs, like you saw, who were harmed by US sanctions that restrict remittances. A small businesswoman in Cuba told Oxfam, and I quote, to limit remittances is to limit private sector growth, unquote. 78% of women and girls now living in Cuba were born under the US embargo. Their whole lives have been shaped by US policies designed to create hunger and desperation in Cuba. They confront daily what it means when U.S. sanctions impede Cuba from procuring goods and services, including technology and financing, as well as food and medicines. They bear the brunt of the impact of the embargo that limits Cuba's capacity to respond to and recover from disasters, such as hurricanes and drought, or the health and economic crisis triggered by COVID pandemic. Finally, I wanna highlight that the embargo is responsible for acute shortages of medicines. Even though Cuba has been producing its own vaccines and medicines for decades with its own manufacturing capacity and know-how, the embargo has prevented or delayed and made more costly Cuba's purchase of inputs and raw materials needed to produce them, as well as its, as its procurement of equipment like ventilators, diagnostic kits, PPE, and syringes. As a result, the US embargo delayed Cuba's COVID vaccine rollout and response, causing greater human suffering and costing lives Still, Cuba is the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean to develop its own safe and effective COVID vaccines, and to date has fully vaccinated nearly 90% of its population, including children as young as two years. The U.S. embargo is an immoral and anti-humanitarian policy whose effects have been multiplied under the COVID pandemic. <laughs> and as the film illustrates, very well, many different voices from various perspectives, including Oxfam, and I think large majorities in the US and Cuba favor ending the embargo. And I agree, we have to do everything necessary now to, to do that, thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, for many years, I worked with Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia um, before I started my Cuba work through the whole process of normalization. Um, and there was a steady growth of American NGOs operating in those three countries. Uh, in Vietnam itself, it was limited on to have their own offices, but as the US moved towards normalization in the years just before that, the Vietnamese permitted American NGOs to have offices there. Um, and the... Uh, if the embargo is ended, I think you could anticipate hundreds of American organizations, um, big and small, local and national, uh, finding partners and engaged in projects in Cuba. Um, 
But until that happens, it, it's very restricted, both because of the points that Stephanie made that folks don't want to take on the administrative and legal burdens of operating in Cuba and sending resources, but also because the Cubans are a bit distrustful of what comes from a country which is engaged in an act of economic warfare against them. And uh, they make, they find it difficult to know motivations and goals of groups that want to come in. So uh, that's one more aspect uh, that would be kind of engagement between the countries that would become possible if the embargo ended. Our next speaker comes from the private sector in the US, the agricultural sector, um, the oldest private sector uh, in, in American, the American economy. Um, and Paul Johnson is the chair of the US Agricultural Coalition for Cuba. Paul. Um, thank you. Uh, let me, <clears throat> let, me uh, let me start by saying that the United States has been allowed to export food to Cuba since 2001 with the passage of the Trade Sanction Reform and Export Enhancement Act that Philip had mentioned earlier. Today, food exports are up compared to last year, but way below what the potential could be. Last year, at least through November, so 11 months of 2021, we exported $267 million in food to Cuba. 95% of that is poultry meat, which by the way, represents about 40% of Cuba's daily protein needs. So $267 million of food exports represents only 15% of all the food imported into Cuba from countries around the world. For US producers, Cuba is obviously not the largest market, but it is significant. For example, for US poultry producers, Cuba is the third largest market in the world today. For US rice producers, Cuba could be the second largest market. We don't sell any wheat to Cuba and Cuba doesn't grow any wheat, but we could sell about $200 million a year. There are also increased opportunities for animal feed as well as other goods. So with increased access and normal trade, the US we believe could capture 60% of the Cuban market. But beyond exports, there are opportunities for the ag world on both sides. Together, we could increase local production in Cuba, specifically around potatoes, dairy, beef, pork, beans, and others. Normal trade also provides opportunities for collaboration to increase exports from Cuba into the United States, two-way trade. Some opportunities include tropical fruit, organics, coffee, tobacco, and aquaculture. Normal relations would also mean helping to decrease Cuba's post-harvest loss, which is caused by poor infrastructure. Opportunities for foreign direct investment would attract needed capital to improve Cuba's infrastructure, resulting in an increase in agricultural production. Lastly, Agriculture is significant in Cuba. Obviously, four out of four people depend on a healthy, safe, and reliable food source. Today's food crisis in Cuba is unnecessary and could be fixed with increased collaboration between U.S. and Cuban agriculture. 20% of Cuba's workforce is employed in the agriculture sector. An increase in production would buoy the economies of each of those families, not to mention the importance of tourism to the Cuban economy and the need for tourists to have a dependable and safe food supply that doesn't compete with the needs of national Cuban consumption. So our goal is to end the embargo, increase market access for US producers and investors, and find that balanced trade 
within agriculture that we have yet to achieve historically. All of that is increasingly difficult under the Biden, under the Biden administration, and the result is an increasing food crisis, lost opportunity to actually build a constructive agricultural relation that would benefit U.S. citizens and Cubans alike. Thank you very much, Paul. Stephanie has another item from Oxfam, another video. Las mujeres tenemos y desarrollamos todos los días una capacidad inventiva y una capacidad de resiliencia y de adaptación a los cambios que tenemos que enfrentar. Desde mis inicios laborales estoy vinculada en el sector agropecuario. poner una manguera, poner un pedazo de cóctel, un pedazo de nail, lo vuelve a unir y aún así mira la fuga de agua que tenemos. La agricultura lleva un deterioro continuo y junto con ella incluso un deterioro del medio ambiente. Es uno de los sectores más golpeados por el bloqueo. Comercializar con los países de América Latina siendo un mercado tan cercano se nos hace imposible prácticamente debido a la característica extraterritorial que tiene el bloqueo. Si no existiera el bloqueo, el índice de productividad y el índice de rendimiento aumentaría. La economía no solo se afecta a nivel nacional, afecta a nivel personal cada una de las casas donde vivimos. Tengo 31 años y hace 60 años vivimos bajo las injustas leyes que nos impone un bloqueo que intenta asfixiarnos. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, one of the rejoinders that would come from people who are opposed to the Cuban government and system is that the problem with agriculture is also a Cuban created problem. The acopio system, which controls the production, uh, tells people what they should grow or tells them that they have to sell a certain portion of the product through the government system. So there's food that goes into the rationing system and the whole state distribution system. Um, Cuban economists have been among the most, the strongest critics about the need to change that agricultural system uh, to provide much greater independence for the, the farmers and to allow them the ability to uh, sell themselves directly on the much more of their product on the market Um, but that's a whole other conversation and, and the embargo, uh, the outside embargo creates a lot of restrictions on it, including the restriction on getting the fertilizer and the resources that, and the equipment that farmers need. Um, so our, our last speaker um, comes from another piece of American Uh, link to Cuba, which is the religious community. Um, it's the aspect which in some ways has had the greatest freedom um, to be able to function um, between the two countries. Um, much of it has been the Protestant evangelical churches or the, the mainline Protestant churches have had long relations But an important part of that is the Catholic Church. Uh, and Jorge Ignacio Fernandez uh, has been very close that. If I can, can pull it up, I will show you uh, a little bit of 
Jorge's life when he met the Pope. Jorge, take it from there. Thank you, John, for putting this magnificent uh, program together as uh, we turn 60 years of this horrible, harsh embargo in Cuba. I was born in Havana, Cuba. Um, and thanks for putting that uh, picture with the Holy Father. Uh, it's the first time that I met him at the Casa Marta at the Vatican in 2013. Been back four or five times since then. Uh, but the, John asked me uh, to focus what the role the Catholic Church has played and will continue to play in the normalization of relations with Cuba. And I thought perhaps go back to 1998. We start with the historic papal visit to Cuba by Pope John Paul II, which I attended and witnessed. And what I've called since then in many of my speeches, the winds of change that he brought within Cuba and relations with the U.S. Fidel, so many of us know, was baptized into the Catholic Church faith and raised by Catholic Jesuit priests from Philadelphia, actually right here, and uh, reached out to the Holy Father after the Russian collapse and pull out in 1990. In 92, Fidel Castro approved the reform to the 1976 Constitution decree that Cuba was no longer an atheist state and the religious freedoms would be respected. That's a law number 82. At that time, Fidel reached out to the Vatican, to the Holy Father, for what some say was diplomatic dialogue and a visit invitation to Cuba. Uh, after Pope John Paul II's visit to Cuba, uh, some of the results that came about was the uh, allowing uh, Christmas to be open, uh, celebrated, and uh, Christmas Day was a national holiday and uh, national uh, Cuba uh, seminaries were allowed to be built and the Catholic press was allowed to Start again with my dear uh, friend, God rest his soul, Cardinal Ortega, played a big role in bringing the Holy Fathers to Cuba. Um, the uh, Pope John Paul, when asked in Cuba, and I was there, what he thought about the embargo, he very quickly stated very firmly, it is oppressive, unjust, and ethically unacceptable. I think we all agree in this panel, many listeners, um, all believers and non-believers during the papal visit of uh, John Paul in Cuba were just simply elated with his visit there, his presence, and uh, the hope at that time of restoring relationship was uh, uh, all-time high. After the papal visit to Cuba, um, a lot of attention, world attention, remember uh, from John Paul going back uh, to, to, to keep going to Cuba. Uh, and here in the States, a lot of new NGOs and uh, groups like Humanitarian Trade with Cuba, which I was a co-founder and Oxfam was a, a big help and participant, uh, emerged and made positive inroads towards normalizing relations and trade with food, medicine, and agriculture products during President Clinton's administration. Uh, in 2012, Pope Benedict XVI went to Cuba, and again, he echoed the words of Pope John Paul II in 1998 that the embargo should be eliminated. Then on December 17th, 2014, President Raul Castro and President Obama, after meeting with Pope Francis, announced the historic agreement to normalize relations between the two nations. And both Raul Castro and President Obama publicly thanked Pope Francis for brokering the Cuba-US deal. The secret negotiations to put an end to the more than five decades of hostilities were carried out inside the Vatican. Pope Francis played a crucial role in smoothing the path for negotiations between Cuba and the U.S. in over 16 months. In 2015, before coming to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, Pope Francis became the third pope in 17 years to visit Cuba and continue stating the harsh embargo should end and no more relations should be established. I had the honor to be at all three papal visits uh, to Cuba. Um, in March 2016, I was in Havana when President Obama became the first president to visit since Calvin Coolidge in 1928. The beginning of normalizing relations with Cuba was moving forward with the reopening of both U.S.-Cuba embassies, removing Cuba from the terrorist list, easing travel and trade restrictions and remittances until President Trump took office and he reversed all the Obama positive initiatives. Fast forward to today. Getting to the end here, President Biden promised during his campaign that the 
he would continue on the path to normalize relations with Cuba and establish by President Obama. But once elected, he has done the opposite. He's done nothing except just make it harsher. Is there a hope that Biden will keep the campaign promise and end the embargo? Will the Vatican play a role in normalizing relations? I say yes to both. I can assure you that Pope Francis already has reminded President Biden that as a good Catholic that he professes to be, he should be keeping his campaign word and listen to the words of the Holy Father to end the embargo and normalize relations. I believe the Vatican is most likely still actively playing a crucial role in smoothing the path to negotiations between Cuba and the U.S. as we speak. We must remember that, I always remember this, the, the, the definition made popular by Einstein of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and getting expecting a different result. This is a failed policy and it's the right time for Biden to keep his promise. Um, on the 60th anniversary, the closing uh, of the harshest and longest embargo, President Biden has a chance to keep his campaign promises and to do the right thing and leave a legacy as a president that ended the longest, harshest embargo. Majority of Americans, majority of Cuban Americans, the United Nations, the Vatican and the world will applaud him and the gesture will be symbolic in many sense throughout the world. I truly believe that the Vatican will continue to play a role and is playing a role as we speak to ensure that this normalization happens. So John, John runs a tight ship, by the way, and I love him. I know John for over 20 years and he said five minutes. So I hope I kept this to five minutes and gave a, a little bit brief background as to how and why the Catholic Church has played an important role and continues to play an important role. And I think uh, we might see something this year, God willing. Thank you, thank you very much, Jorge. Um, I have just opened up the chat so everybody can, you can communicate as you know with individuals if you use the arrow down and choose who you want to write to, or you can communicate with everyone, or you communicate with the speakers. Uh, that's up to you, but it's now open. And the Q&A remains open. We've, some questions have been answered individually, but we'll come back to them in, in, for general discussion. Let me also say that um, we will not only put up the video on YouTube of this whole event, so others can see it who, who uh, want to it in the future, or if you want to look at it again or share it with friends. But also we will um, put the Q&A and the chat on the blog page so that uh, you have the option of copying from the chat directly on this now, or you can go back. Once I get that up in a day or two, you'll be able to to take it, the various addresses um, off of the, the blog page. Um, we're gonna go into a little bit of discussion among the panelists before we go to the Q and A. Um, and I wanna start it out a little bit and in part specifically directed to Phil, but everybody's got an opinion sure on this, uh, which is why, why is it still in existence. If, if something has led to the US being so unpopular internationally and has rigidified any hopes of change in Cuba and has made people suffer in Cuba, um, but has not brought about its goal of um, the collapse of, of Cuban society and the end of the revolution, why 60 years later is there still an embargo? Uh, and where do you see any hope that it could be ended? Phil, do you wanna? Sure, I'll start. Uh, that question has been asked also in uh, the Q and A, uh, and I've tried to answer that. First, there is no rational explanation. Uh, this is not, if the United States wanted to improve human rights in Cuba, which it claims it's, its goal, it would end the embargo. Uh, Cuba rightly feels threatened by the embargo because it's an act of war. 
and it was, as I pointed out, was intended to overthrow the Cuban government, at least part of a project to do so. Um, and so when a country faced with the most powerful country in the world uh, is told that it's an enemy, it's going to be worried and there will be repression. There was repression in the United States after 9-1-1. Uh, people were caught up in the, uh, in the Patriot Act. And that's not to excuse the repression in Cuba, but uh, the way to end that is to provide for a less hostile atmosphere. Uh, so the, clearly the embargo is irrational. So what explains its continuity? First, uh, the domestic politics. Uh, uh, so the Republicans have done very well by, uh, seemingly well by uh, being hostile to Cuba, okay, although President Obama relaxed the embargo and won uh, a near majority of Cuban Americans in 2012. Um, so it may not have been the best politics, but they old, but money flows to the Republican Party. That now the Democrats also feel that they can win back Florida, uh, or at least some seats in Florida, if they continue a harsh policy. This seems to be President Biden's view, and it takes uh, when the president isn't inclined to change your policy. It takes a, a staffer uh, on say the National Security Council to really push something forward. And there is no staffer who wants to change the policy in the White House. So domestic politics, particular idiosyncratic factors in the current administration, uh, a legacy of fear, but that there'll be domestic repercussions. Anybody else want to venture on that? Paul, do you have some thoughts about when the agriculture community would benefit so much from ending the embargo? Why aren't we getting more pressure out of the ag state, state senators? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I think domestic politics, like Bill mentioned, is, is the number one cause. Um, but others in the ag world, uh, bandwidth. Right, I mean, people working in D.C. If they're if they're working on changing agricultural policy with global partners, Cuba is not going to be on your your, your top three, um, it, just because of the market size of Cuba. That's a reality. Entering the Cuban world and trying to untangle uh, sixty years of uh, discord is is challenging. It, it takes a lot of political capital. Uh, very few congressmen are comfortable with this with the. Uh, with the topic. Certainly you don't want to go and, and run um, into Senator Menendez, Menendez in the hallway and have to have a conversation about his family and his Cuban American heritage. If uh, you know, you're from Arkansas or Illinois for that matter. Um, I would also add that there's just simply a lack of leadership in the House and, and the Senate to, to take on this issue. Uh, we have had some champions in the past in Congress, but they're no longer there. I'm thinking of uh, Senator Flake from Arizona, uh, Senator Heitkamp was obviously a champion. Um, Senator Leahy has always been great, but unfortunately he's retiring. So those are the challenges that we face on a daily basis. Even though the ag world would benefit from increased trade, it's tough to get the issue on the radar uh, in D.C. Jorge, what do you, in terms of the Cuban-American community, either Jorge, do you, the, the poll numbers seem to have shown that during Obama, the majority of the community, or at least the Florida community, was in, for ending the embargo, but now it's gone the other way. A majority are against ending the embargo. What, what would change that? Uh, well, first of all, as a Cuban-American who's never lived in Florida, there are Cuban Americans who live outside of Florida. I know that may come as a shock to many people, um, but it is it, it is true that obviously South Florida has the largest concentration. Uh, number two is Las Vegas. If uh, if there's any organizers in Nevada on the call, uh, and, and Miami has played uh, an oversized role in, in this political space. Um, you, you know, I would say, like you said, when Obama. Uh, stood up for an alternative, for a, a different vision of, of what the relationship between the United States and Cuba could be, 
the the elector uh, the electors responded, and even in Miami, they supported it. And one, the Democrats won two out of the three congressional seats. Uh, you know, following uh, Biden's inaction on his campaign promises. Uh, I, I, it's it's got to be tough for a pro-engagement Cuban American to to speak up for engagement when even the president he or she may have worked for in the campaign may have volunteered for has backed away from those promises. So there's nothing but risk for a Cuban American, especially in, in South Florida, to come up and and, and speak for engagement. Um, I, I would direct people. You know, Univision does a presidential poll. And the one that was done for the 2020 campaign had uh, 200 pages of cross tabs. And if you're an old political hack like me, you love cross tabs. Uh, but there's fascinating data in there. And as Cuban Americans got further away from Miami in geography, they got further away in ideology and were more pro engagement. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. I, as a fellow Cuban American born in Havana and not lived very long in Miami. I think we were there about two years uh, when we came over in the 60s and then moved on north. Um, I, I think in, in, in Miami today is what we call the loud minority and the Rubios. And, and we, we see that as a shrinking minority, but they're the loud minority. Um, we see that the majority of Americans and Cuban Americans still, and not just Miami, but overall, one engagement and one an end to the embargo. People who um, have focused largely on Cuba may not remember the history with Vietnam, but there was this war and there were 56,000 Americans killed and more wounded. And of course, two or 3 million Vietnamese who died. But within 20 years of the end of the war, President Clinton had the authority to lift the embargo and he did it. And that was actually a year before he did normalization of relations. And those two steps uh, tra fundamentally transformed it. At this point, the US is the largest market for products exports from Vietnam. And we're the second largest source of tourists to Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnamese are about the 13th largest grouping of foreign students in the United States. If the US government had listened to the political leaders of the Vietnamese community in the US, none of that would have happened. Um, you can still find echoes of that position, people flying the old Saigon flag. Um, but the US was very clever when it resettled people. It spread them all over the country. And there was never the cluster of power. The biggest concentration is California, but California is an immense and generally liberal state. So the Vietnamese American community has never had that kind of political power. And as a result, uh, there is intense engagement between Vietnamese Americans and Vietnam with hundreds of thousands of people going every year for Tet the new year uh, and, cons and a lot of Vietnamese American investment. Um, a lot of Vietnamese young people going and getting jobs in Vietnam with the dual culture and language skills. So it's a model that I think is not impossible in Cuba. Um, anybody else wanna talk about that or we, should we go on? Or are there any comments or questions among yourselves? you would like to raise. Go to the Q&A. Okay. All right. Um, there's some people who have asked to say things and I'm going to call on them, but let's, let's look at what we've got, some written questions. And Mika, I want to go back to one that you answered directly, but I think is, is still very important. One of the things that's strikingly different about this film is that it says more than one thing. <laughs> uh, the, it, it says at the core the wrongness of the embargo and the destruction, destructiveness of it. But it also, you hear from Cubans who are not fond of their own 
government and the political system, but are equally strong against the embargo. Could you say something about why you included them and what the reaction has been to their role in the film? So the reactions are many. Um, I think I already mentioned why I included it because of my commitment to express the truth. And uh, there is the truth that is a lot of discontent with the Cuban government within Cuba too, not just outside. And guess what? What country doesn't have peoples that are discontent? And they have several reasons to, to, to be discontent with a lot of things. Like uh, I saw, for example, a question in the chat on, or it wasn't a question, with was someone that said that was a little bothered by the fact that I didn't interview anybody from the Cuban government. Um, but the thing is, is that as a documentary filmmaker, I don't necessarily think that I need to interview anybody from a government. Uh, neither did I feel the need to interview the US government uh, on this. I was wanting to know what the people thought. And so some of these people are these dissidents, right? Uh, in this case of Miguel and Lynn, they are artists and they, uh, they walk at a fine line. You know, they put out their art that is very critical of several things that happen in, in Cuba. But at the same time, they don't engage directly in protests in the streets. And that is how they are not in jail. <laughs> and so I think it's important too, you know, to understand that uh, this, is, uh, this also happens. And it, does, it happens in the United States too. Don't you hear? Don't you read every every day of people getting arrested because they were in protests in the United States? So I think it's just a little strange that oh, if it's Cuba, oh, then they are uh, they are having you know attacking human rights. Yes, they, there's largely the Cuban government attacks human rights and civil liberties, and the United States does that too, you know. <laughs> and I'm not saying with that that that's okay. That it's not okay. If you're a true progressive, you're not going to condone uh, civil rights abuse or human rights abuse from any government or any person, right? Um, so I think it's important to show that because this idea that we're going to portray Cuba as this paradise, who do we think we're fooling? You know, everybody knows that there are many problems in Cuba. So I think that that's a disservice. Mm -hmm. I think it's way better when we actually look at the real situation and we say, well, but the embargo has, doesn't have to, we don't have to have uh, hold strings attached to lift the embargo because this is a mistake that has been made by the United States in the first place because Cuba did not attack the United States. So we don't have a reason to have an embargo on this country. We Thank just you. do this, or we, I, I don't know not doing this and I'm not condoning this, but the United States does this because the United States feels that it has the right to impose what it thinks in terms of economic uh, models or political models to all every country in the world. And I am like outraged at that. I am a Latin American. I am a Brazilian. I have suffered imperialism economically, politically, and culturally in Brazil. And I do not think that the United States does any service to the world when it does that. Excuse my rage, but I get mad at that. <laughs> so that's why my film has these, these sides that are not just two sides. You know, it's in fact a lot of intricacies in this. And we can't just be looking at one way, like you said, John. Yeah, I, in our newsletter that I published last week, I go on probably at too great length that it's always been a puzzle to me why the dissidents, the opponents of the government aren't at the head of the parade calling for the end of the embargo um, because their situation would be transformed more dramatically by that single step than by whatever money they're getting from US programs, which brings us to a question, Phil, that Nicholas Long asked, 
He said, I recall reading that the US government sends 16 million to Cuba to support democracy, including the July demonstrations. How does that money get to Cuba? Bill, do you well, want to? I actually uh, typed the answer for that question. Yeah. Um, but so, other people will want to go ahead. Sure. So there is a written answer. Uh, but uh, it's first, some of it stays in the United States. Uh, it's distributed to uh, some consulting firms, to the National Endowment for Democracy, which then gives it to the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, which then spends it on hiring people in the United States. Some of it gets to Cuba uh, indirectly by uh, setting up websites in the United States. This is what happened in July. The main website that uh, was used to, to start the demonstrations in July was housed in Miami, paid for by USAID. Uh, and actually the number is $20 million for supporting uh, democracy promotion in Cuba, not 16 million. Uh, and then there are people who bring down money uh, when they travel. It's harder in the last year because of COVID, but money gets directly given or put in bank accounts uh, abroad for people. Uh, and it, it often not a lot of money, but it's enough to sustain them. Um, the, uh, and uh, if people want to learn more about this, there's a wonderful website that's organized by Tracy Eaton, who used to be a reporter for Dallas um, Morning News and uh, is now follows how this money is spent. It's called the Cuba Money Project, and that's its website, cubamoneyproject.com. Uh, and you can get a lot of detail there. I often one, you know, we know how the US responds if another country puts money into our politics. That's what the first impeachment <laughs> trial was about in some ways. The, uh, or not the impeachment trial, this, the uh, investigation. Um, and the fact that we blithely think that we can appropriate this money to change Cuban politics is I think part of the problem. It's part of the reason why the opponents uh, alienate themselves from much of the people of the country because they don't condemn the embargo. They, support the embargo. It's very hard to organize among your own people when you're in favor of something which hurts them. At any rate, Cynthia Paris Alonso, can, can you speak now? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Cynthia has, made, has produced an absolutely wonderful book on Cuban food. Uh, go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Well, I wanna thank you for um, participating today. Um, the film is really interesting and insightful on so many levels, and so are all the discussions today. Um, I've been documenting Cuba since 1992. I've uh, been a photojournalist. I've got two books about Cuba, Passage to Cuba and A Taste of Cuba, and, um, and I'm married to a Cuban, and um, I was, I covered the uh, the Papal visit in 1998, and I covered Obama's visit and Ilian's return, and I've documented a lot of um, news events in the past 28 years. And one thing that I think, one nuance that hasn't been mentioned today, um, for one thing, I like to say that this is, ending the embargo and doing business with Cuba is probably the one bipartisan issue that we have in our polarized country right now. Um, Republicans and Democrats alike see Cuba as an emerging market and would like to travel to Cuba, would like to do business with Cuba. Um, as it's been noted, there's a majority of Americans and possibly Cuban Americans that want to end the embargo the nuance that really hasn't been discussed is that to actually end the embargo has to be an act of Congress. And the family, the Diaz-Ballart family who are Cuban Americans and um, are part of the Florida political machine, they position themselves in Congress so that 
a vote on ending the embargo never gets to the floor. It never gets out of committee. Um, and so it's really Cuban American politics in Florida that have kept the embargo law for so many years um, because of the, the influence of the Cuban Americans in Florida. Um, what Obama did was he used executive powers as president. He couldn't end the embargo, but he was able to encourage cultural exchange and uh, freedom of travel. And that was widely popular here. And I think Biden, who was part of the Obama administration when that was done, I, I think Biden and his staff agree, they campaigned on doing it. And I don't think that it's a question of nobody in Biden's administration wants to actually end the embargo or take this issue on. Because I happen to know Blinken's family and, and they do want to end the embargo. It's, it's politics. And I think that they really are hoping to gain democratic seats in Florida possibly dethrone Rubio in, in the midterm elections. And so they can't really rock the boat and, and initiate Cuban policy change until after the midterm elections. So I think we could very likely see something happen after that. Um, and it certainly helps if anybody on this uh, Zoom is from Florida to, to please um, mention or, um, you know, state your opinions with your vote. Um, and, and likewise, I think the letter that a lot of uh, senators sent to Biden has meaning and impact, but it's not really going to affect change until after the midterm elections. So I do think it's a bipartisan issue. I think that a majority of Americans would like it to go back. I think it's a humanitarian issue. I think Cubans and Americans want an end to the embargo. It's more complicated and essentially it's political, but there's a lot. Thanks, thanks very much, Cynthia. Uh, if you're into Cuban food, get her book. Um, any rate, uh, we are, I'm gonna take a couple of more questions and then we have one or two other people who will speak from the floor. Um, Mika, somebody was asking about being able to see the video after the Zoom. Do you wanna explain what will be possible? And there's something when you talk, there's a scratching sound. I don't know whether the microphone is rubbing against something or, but go ahead. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, if you want to watch the film again, you can uh, go to my website and I'm going to put it again on the chat. It's uh, movingimages.pictures and you can go to awards and screenings page and you can find um, the upcoming screenings. And you can also just write me an email and I'm going to put you in our email list. We only send newsletters to maximum twice a month. So I'm not gonna flood your inbox, but you will know when the next uh, screenings are coming. Uh, we are in negotiations now with a distributor that I am very much wanting to work with. This is a connection that came through the United Nations Association Film Festival. And so I'm really hoping this go through but we're, I'm st we're still waiting. So that's why the film is not out there in Vimeo On Demand. Uh, it will soon be, hopefully, uh, distributed by this, this distribution company. And in the meantime, you can get to know of other screenings uh, by visiting my website. And I already see someone put their email in the chat and I'm going to put your email in my email list. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, I don't know if Bob Michaels is still on. He had asked to say something. Um, Bob, if you're if you're still on, I can pull. You should be able to speak now. Um, yes, John, I am yes, here. Go ahead. 
Now, I question, are we too focused on ending the embargo to the extent of diminished looking for what is best to improve the lives of the Cuban people? We hear some great focus on ending the embargo, and I I live in Cuba part-time. I look at the problems the Cuban people have. And my background is in problem solving, economic problem solving. I ask, do these problems come from the U.S. embargo or some other source? And in almost every case, it comes back and says the root cause of the problem of the Cuban people is not the U.S. embargo, which causes me to ask, given the difficulties of ending the embargo, should we be focused on those parts that cause problems for the Cuban people, identifying them and excluding them the way we have travel, excluded food sales, pharmaceutical sales. And I ask, what are those specific, not general, specific problems that the embargo is causing to the Cuban people. I'm curious to hear what experts said. Thanks. Somebody want to answer his his question? If you if you're stopping short of the embargo as a whole, what what do you think is most important to focus on? Well, I would say right. Oh, look, Stephanie. Stephanie, go yeah, ahead. I'd, I just say say really briefly. I I think um, one thing that that um, in my I, I, while I haven't lived, I've been to to Cuba um, visiting Oxfam programs there, and and one thing I think is is clear is that that. Um, um, Cubans are, for the most part, have really um, a strong education and lots of creativity. And um, there is a, there's a lot of things that that at least you know women and 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 local organizations that that are doing and can do a lot more of, as you saw in in in, in the couple of videos. Um, and I think the. The, the embargo actually does restrict their communication exchange. Um, a lot of it's amazing. Just um, uh, I was there just before the pandemic and young people in terms of it's, it's in Oxfam's paper um, as well. Some of the, um, the, the things that they're doing with, um, with applications, with digital, there's a lot of creativity there, but they're limited by, by what they can do. They can't, they can't, um, they can't expand their business because they can't do tra cash, tra cash, cash um, um, tra uh, um, transactions for to sell things. I mean, there's there's so many limitations that they face. That's not the, that's not going to be the solution to all the problems. But we are not talking about you know an uneducated, underdeveloped country here. You know, there there's they, there's a, a huge wealth of 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 resources in people. And if they only had the tools and the ability to to um, to exchange and to to bring in some of the the inputs they need to to scale up and expand their work, I think that would change things a lot. Now, what we what one of the things that Oxfam has been focused on, and what is really important, is to address inequality in, in Cuban society. And inequality exists, and it has been getting worse. And that is, you know, so you do see, and I'm sure you've seen if you've spent more time in Havana than I have, you've seen some of that um, inequality in, in in certain communities and and where there are um, um, communities that are, 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 you know, very basic um, uh, in terms of, of their their living conditions. But so so those things need to be addressed. They could be addressed through through public programs if the government didn't have to spend um, and society didn't have to spend so much money to get basic things that cost twice as much because of the embargo that makes it more expensive to acquire things. So I think um, um, govern, government revenue and resources could go a lot further in addressing inequality if there wasn't the embargo that, that raised the prices of everything to import. Thanks. Well, one real quick comment. I've had the uh, my 39 trips since 98 uh, to, to Cuba and having the, the luxury traveling from Pinar de Rio 
to Santiago and every town in between, unanimously, they want the bloqueo, the embargo lifted. Some of them have their grudges, like every country, like you mentioned before, but uh, the, the embargo really hits deep. Uh, this gentleman uh, is living in Havana, so he's got a, a different perspective. But uh, again, from, from Pinar del Rio to Santiago and every town in between, um, had the luxury to, to meet uh, the Cuban brothers and sisters, and it's the embargo that they want to live. Actually, Bob hangs out in the Holguin area, not, not Havana area. Oh, so by Santiago. He is, yeah, well, Holguin so, would not consider itself by Santiago. Santiago is by Holguin. <laughs> <laughs> well, At any sure. rate, um, I'm going to a couple other people. Norman Savitt, if you unmute yourself. Arturo. Yeah, Arturo. Can you, or do I need to? We have Arturo Lopez. Yeah, I will go to him next, but all right. Well, Arturo, can you unmute yourself? Go ahead. Arturo, you should be able to speak now. I don't know if you are hearing me. Yes, okay. now we do. Yeah, perfect. So uh, first of all, congratulate uh, the filmmaker and also the great panel that you have organized. But I would like to highlight also the harm. And I don't know how it is related to the, the question by Bob before, but uh, I would like also to highlight the harm that the U.S. policy of regime change change imposed from from abroad, the harm that this has caused to the Cuban uh, internal debate, and this is something that it's very important because it has created the idea of a fortress under siege, and it shaped the framework, the policy frontiers of the debate in ways that make very difficult the discussion of what can be achieved by having a different system or uh, reforms that are part of the system. And I just want to mention something that is very specific that came out, I think it was on Monday or last week, but I learned about on Monday. Uh, economist Pavel Vidal has just published an article in uh, Instituto Real del Cano from Spain, in which he shows how the restriction, the, the sanctions, and particularly the restriction on remittances, hit uh, 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 with, in a more severe way the private sector and the households than the Cuban government. So any, anybody that basically want to talk about the promotion of reforms, the expansion of the economic changes in Cuba must take into account the damage that the embargo is causing. The embargo blockade, I think it's better to call it blockade because it violates many restrictions that even international humanitarian law in conditions of war, a, a pilot, for instance, bomb an electrical plant of a hospital, it, it will have to be accountable for that according to international humanitarian law. But a sanctions, for instance, that prevent a spare part for an electrical plant or a hospital in Cuba doesn't have to be account to anybody. So I'm, I'm giving you a, a couple of exams, examples about that. Uh, so, so first of all, the, this is important. The second is that uh, although this policy is proclaimed on the basis of human rights, uh, if there is something that is everything except human rights is the embargo policy towards Cuba. And I, I'm, I'm not gonna go there very deep because I wanna be short to the third point that I want to point out as a Cuban Americans. We don't live in the Cuban American community, a, a typical condition for a debate about US policy towards Cuba. We live in, a, in an environment that is unfriendly to freedom of expression in this debate. There has been threats, there has been violent actions against Cuban Americans. And in addition to that, there are organizations who receive, that receive money 
from the U.S. government under the mandate of telling the truth to the Cuban people that the Cuban government hides, but they are used to silence voices or to label as communists or communist sympathizers or agents of influence or traitors to the United States that are, uh, uh, um, this, this organization use those labels, la labels and they use uh, the money that come with the programs for democracy promotion to attack people like me that do that or Quintana or, 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 or Henrique or other people that do that. Something that, that we need as soon as possible uh, is the issue of, of, of the reports that were produced in the 1990s, but unfortunately, the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and some of the organizations are failing to the Cuban people and the Cuban American community when, when they don't bring some light to reiterate that we have gone back after the presidency of Donald Trump in this area. And this is obviously harming uh, us uh, with 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 uh, uh, with accusation of being anti-American, but the anti-American attitude, the anti-American behavior against the values of these great nations are the ones that are happening by these groups, sometimes with the U.S. government money. Thank you. Um, Phil needs to leave in a few minutes to teach a class. Do you want to say anything, Phil, before you do that? No, I, I think Arturo's intervention here was very useful. Um, and uh, it raises the point about what the president could do without lifting the embargo. He could open up, uh, he could take Cuba off the uh, list of state sponsors of terrorism, which would make transactions easier internationally. Uh, he uh, certainly can allow remittances. He can allow for uh, travel. Uh, and uh, President Biden has chosen not to do any of that. Yeah. All right, thank you. We're going to end up in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Josue, oh, I don't, I'm probably not pronouncing your name properly. You are. You did it actually. It's, okay. uh, <laughs> you did perfect. Uh, thank you for this. Is it's my Peace Corps training. Go ahead. <laughs> So I'm also a filmmaker. I, I haven't been uh, able to watch the film. I actually just joined in uh, pretty much just saw the, the tweet didn't see before. And I'm in DC right now. I'm from Havana, uh, used to live in Miami and then went back to Cuba. And I've been in Cuba for the last eight years helping uh, foreign media outlets get their job done. So I provide production services and I've been uh, very busy in the Obama time and after Trump came in, that hit me immediately. So being Cuban American, by definition now, technically, uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, it, it, it impacted me directly in a very strong way. And I'm very privileged because I, I, I have the ability to come to the US, set up a bank account and, and have payments even sent here. So so for every for Cubans in my field, for example, in, in the filmmaking business, it's very hard. The 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 embargo it's one of the things that hurts uh, people in media the most. People that are uh, photographers, filmmakers, even the, any other artist that is trying to access platforms for distribution of their work, it's a it's an absolute nightmare. And most of these platforms and most of these media outlets that used to come to Cuba to work, they don't even want to do it anymore. Uh, fundamentally, because of not even the embargo, but for the addition to the to the sponsoring uh, terrorism country list, again, because it scares the banks and the lawyers the most. So uh, going to the most important point of, of, of the talks in the last minutes I've been listening, I think we should focus efforts not on the embargo because we don't have, I don't believe we have a political scenario now where we could bring that to vote even. Uh, I don't think you would get to, to even be a case for voting on that right now, but on what Biden could do with a stroke of a pen and he could reverse all of Trump's sanctions back and push much forward on executive power like Obama did, and we saw a very positive change. 
in a in a booming economy in Cuba in in those two years. So, as a film major myself, I'm, I'm working on a film for the last four years called Cuba: a Journey to the Heart of the Caribbean. It's the first uh, IMAX film uh, shot in Cuba. Uh, we had a small run, but uh, but we're still. Uh, struggling to find the funding after Trump came into power where everybody got scared of the word Cuba and our film is called Cuba. So uh, it, it even creates confusion beyond uh, uh, the reality of it. And it's just, we stayed away from all politics, but we are trying to show what the Cuban people are capable of in, in the arts, in science, and uh, just by pushing and being resilient and despite this embargo that has been there, which we of course mention in the film because it's a fact of history, but, but we try to stay away uh, just to show what the Cuban people is without any political affiliation and, and beyond that. So I urge everyone here to you know, support all films. Uh, I'll, I promise I'll, I'll see this one and I would uh, love to stay in touch uh, with you if, you, if you're working on uh, on distribution, and I can help in any way. Great. Uh, well, I hope, Josue, I hope we'll be in touch, uh, and uh, you can send me a note. Well, I have, I think I have your email because I'm you registered. If, if you type yeah. my name online, Josue Lopez Lozano, I'll pop up very fast. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for joining. Mika, could you talk about Coyula's fundraising problem as a final example, and then we're going to wrap it up. Oh, this was when he was raising money for um, Corazon Azul, which is his latest film, Blue Heart. And he was using uh, a crowdfunding uh, platform in the United States with a bank account in Bolivia. And the, the embargo even uh, blocked like $5,000 that he had raised. By the way, the, the money has not been returned to the people who, who paid. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just, it's a very small example considering everything that happens in Cuba. But uh, just talking about filmmaking, sometimes we, a lot of times we make like really low budget or almost no budget films and the crowdfunding is, is a help. So this is another example of how the tentacles of the embargo get to everything. Yep, and that gives me a good opportunity to note that if people want like the film, I'm sure there are many unpaid bills associated with it at this point. And on the chat is the link, or if you go to Mika to Mereta's website, you'll see the link to donate to support the film. So uh, your contributions would be most welcome. Uh, anybody have any final thoughts? Uh, Stephanie, Paul, Jorge, Jorge. Uh, I, I, I guess I'll say, uh, I, I want to just touch on Bob's question. If we uh, assume the embargo's in place and it's going to be in place, I, I would say engage. Um, go to Cuba. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's harder than it was a few years ago, but it's still possible. Uh, go to Cuba, make those relationships with, with Cubans on the ground. Um, and, and each of us in our own way can, uh, can help bring down the embargo just by engaging with people in Cuba. Um, you know, that, that would be my recommendation. It's, it's not easy as someone, I, I can't even fly into Santiago right now. It's impossible to find an American flight into Santiago, um, you know, uh, which is, you know, fine, but I guess technically the embargo prohibits me from using inner city transport. So I guess I could walk from Havana, but, um, you know, do what you can to engage with Cubans. There's independent Cuban media out there. Um, there's Cuban businesses that are available to Americans on the website. Um, and, and finally, I'll just say, you know, it's not an either or proposition. Uh, it is okay to stand up for our human rights beliefs and criticize the Cuban government when they do something that is worthy of criticism. Um, but we should also take into uh, account that our actions are a huge cause of impediment and suffering in Cuba. Um, anyway, I guess what I'm saying is uh, complain about both sides. But what I'm really saying is, uh, you know, engage, go 
go interact with as many Cubans as you can in Cuba. Just, Stephanie. Just a final word for me. I, um, I, I agree with that, but I just want to add that there, the blockade, blockade embargo, I think we refer, we're talking about all of the policies, both the laws in Congress, as well as um, the, the administrative decrees, and, and Phil went through a whole range of them. It's a complex web. The point is that, as Josue said, there are many things that can be done very easily and simply by the administration, and the administration is not doing that. And, and those steps can make a huge difference now. Um, it was very different, as you've heard others say, under the, the Obama years than it is now for Cubans and particularly under the pandemic. And so pushing for a change in those policies that the administration can change is really critical. The embargo, the legislative aspects are going to take more time. Thank you. And thank you for, for everyone who's participated today. Paul, Jorge Ignacio, do you? Uh, I'm good. Excellent. Thank you for inviting me. A great, great uh, panel and discussion. And at the end of the day, 60 year anniversary we're in right now, this harsh embargo is a failed policy. It's insanity. And the only thing it's accomplished for the architects of it is their objective to hurt the innocent people by cutting off food and medicine. So we should all be doing what we can to get to Congress, get to Biden, and end this embargo now. Paul. Oh. You want to say? Yeah, I agree with Jorge, what he, what he just said. You know, it hasn't worked 60 years. I mean, wherever you stand on the issue, whatever your intent is in Cuba, you know, this, this hasn't worked. So we need to try something else. And, and you know, we're not going to, um, you know, I think everyone on the island would agree that they want Cuban independence and Cuban sovereignty. And you can't have that if there's a, if there's, the U.S. is trying to embargo the country. You know, we need Cuba civil society to develop the country that they want to on their own terms, which would require an end to the embargo and U.S. meddling in, in their country. So I hope that uh, at least we can all come to some common sense and, and try something new as opposed to what we've been doing for the last 60 years. Thank you. Phil, any final? Well, thank you very much for organizing this. I think there's a lot of information and people can... Now look at the film again if they'd like. Mika, thank you for creating the opportunity for us to come together. Thank you too, John. Thank you all of you for the work you're doing. Thank you all participants for your interest in this. And like I said, a hundred times, if you want to be a more engaged, there are several ways that you can engage. One of them, if you want to request a community screening in your town, you just get in contact with me and let's keep pushing this. Great, thank you. So my last words are these, as, as Jorge said, go to Cuba. It actually is not very hard at all. The flights are now happening again. They're not as outrageously rip off as the original prices were. Um, you can also go through other places. You can get to Santiago couple of times a week from Jamaica. Uh, don't just look at American Airlines, look at going through Mexico or Jamaica or Grand Cayman. Um, there are lots of ways to get there. Support for the Cuban people is wide open as a license. You, as long as you're staying in a, well, you have to stay in a Casa Particular because Biden hasn't changed the Trump rules that stop you from staying in a hotel. Um, so, um, I think incrementalism is great. Everything, every, that's what Obama was trying to do, but because all he could do was incrementalism, he had this wonderful trip to Havana, and as he left, there were Cubans talking about the Trojan horse, that Obama seemed to be doing all of these nice things, but actually beneath the surface, it was still regime change. Uh, Phil said at the beginning, it was an act of war. It is an act of war. Economic warfare is as hurtful, not maybe not as hurtful as having your house bombed, but it is terribly hurtful and it creates suspicion, uh, fear. And I think in a, I mean, I've always favored the incremental approach, but I'm beginning to think 
um, if we can't even get incrementalism out of uh, president, we probably most of us on this screen and in this uh, Zoom work to get into power, um, whether we should go for a bigger demand and find the ways to make that happen. I, uh, my, uh, as some people know who are on this call, my thesis is if you follow the words of our Secretary of State about Russia and Ukraine, about how spheres of influence should not be part of the 21st century and that a big country should not be telling a little country how it should organize itself. I hope he looks in the mirror uh, because that defines exactly what US policy has been towards Cuba with the embargo. And who knows, maybe the off ramp is that the Russians back off from Ukraine and the US backs off from Cuba. And we accept that our neighbors actually have the right to define their own lives and screw up things as much as all of us are capable of screwing up things and find their own solutions to those screw ups. So thank you very much for joining us. The, the video will be available. Um, I'll, everybody who registered will get a note about how to do it. I'll on the blog about the same point will be the chat and Q and A information, including Mika's uh, email address. So be well and let's hope there isn't a 61st anniversary of the embargo. Thank you. Thank you.